Hi, everyone. Welcome to CAMFest. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, my name is Sapna Sakya. I'm the Talent Development and Special Ma Projects Manager here at CAM. Um, we're thrilled tonight to have with us the filmmaking team and the protagonists from the film Manzanar Diverted, When Water Becomes Dust, um, and to be here with all of you watching. We'd like to acknowledge our wonderful co-presenters of this film, their organizations who serve and support diverse communities. For this program, we'd like to thank A Radical Guide, San Francisco Indie Fest, and San Francisco Documentary Festival, Livable Planet Film Festival, Vision Maker Media, Films of, Rem Films of Remembrance, Hapa Mag, soon to be called Mixed Asian Media, Asian Art Museum, and last but not least, ADOC. Programs like CAMFest 2021 and CAM's other year-round programming are made possible by our community of supporters from around the world help us bring compelling and diverse Asian American stories to light. Please donate or join as a CAM member at CAM's secure website, caamedia.org. For a limited time, new members can save 15% on our friend and supporter memberships using the promo code Celebrate Stories. This film is eligible for our, for our audience award. So to vote, please click the link above the video player and winners will be announced right after the festival. You are also able to ask questions of the filmmakers and the protagonists. Please put your question in the question box under the video. You just watched Manzanar Diverted, When Water Becomes Dust. The film is a complex history of water centered around the Paya Hunadu, um, also known as the Land of Flowing Water and the Owens Valley. This beautiful and meditative film follows an alliance of former Japanese American World War II incarcerees, the Numu Paiuti people who were, once, who were once forced from their homeland and ranchers and farmers turned environmental activists who come together to defend this valley and its water against Los Angeles's unending thirst. We're honored to have with us today director and producer Anne Kaneko, producer and impact producer Jin Yu Kim, and two of the protagonists from the film, Kathy Bancroft of the Lone Pine Tribal Historic Preservation, um, an officer with the tribal with the Lone Pine Tribal Historic Preservation um, Organization as well as Warren Furutani, co-founder of the Manzanar Committee and a former LA Public Works Commissioner. Thank you so much for taking the time. Please help me welcome them onto the stage. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for being here and taking, the, taking your Sunday evening to join us in this conversation. Of course. Oh, yes, we're thrilled to be here. <laughs> yes, thank you. Congratulations on this beautiful film, everyone. It's such an amazing and important film. I feel like everyone should watch, not just about the history of this state, but about of but of the country as well. Um, I wanted to I wanted to definitely ask everyone questions, but I wanted to start off maybe with Anne, if you could talk a little bit about you know, your inspiration for the film, how you came to this film. Um, and also if you had envisioned this film uh, becoming what it is, what it what it did ultimately. Um, I know you've had a long journey, but I wanted to hear, you know, the story of how this film came about. You know, this film started out um, as kind of a humanities project, I guess. I was asked to be part of this humanities team looking at Manzanar and sort of interfaith, intercultural connections. Um, so we all attended the Manzanar pilgrimage. And I was really trying to find a different way of looking at this place because, you know, there've been so many amazing films made about Manzanar. And, you know, I, I 
was hesitant to sort of go down that road, obviously. So um, I think for me, what what was what I was interested in was really about the land, you know, that land that that where Manzanar was situated, and then also kind of the histories and of and potential intersections be, between Japanese Americans and Native Americans. I mean, I think I understood or knew that the you know the Bureau of, of, of Indian Affairs was somehow involved with the um, camps when they were established when the WR established them. So, you know, I think those were some interests. And then, of course, when I went there and started really doing research, I realized that this was Los Angeles's watershed. And you know, my family's been three generations in Los Angeles, and although it was always very abstract, and I understood that that our water came from the north, came from the Sierras. I didn't really understand how that broke down. And so when I realized that the valley was owned, 90% owned by the city of Los Angeles, it really struck me. And I felt like if I didn't know that history, then probably many others didn't really understand that history. I mean, I, I, I had a very general understanding. So I think all of those things really um, sort of sent me down this path. And you know, it originally started out as kind of this shorter film, kind of more of an art project. And then it kind of grew and grew. I mean, Kathy has been there the whole time. And so she can, you know, she she knows what this has been like. And I, um, you know, but I always imagined it being sort of a meditative piece that it wouldn't, that it wasn't sort of your typical environmental film. And it also wasn't a film that was just these, you know, pe talking heads, people talking about their their stories and experiences. I really wanted it to be experiential. I wanted people to under to feel this place and the land, and um, that those were my intentions. Well, I feel like you really achieved that. You know, I mean, in addition to learning about the different communities that are. Um, you know, portrayed in the film, the landscape itself, I feel like, you know, you've really captured what it used to be like, what it is like today, what it was like, you know, as experienced by the native communities that live there, but also um, as um, incarcerees of Manzanar, you know? So tell me a little bit of, a, of, of like creating that, I guess, that visual landscape in the film. Um, how did you do it? I know there was amazing drone footage, but aside from that, I feel like you created this really um, sort of uh, lively sense of this place um, that I've not seen in other films. I, I feel like, you know, because I, the film was such a long journey and, and um, you know, the archival research that went into this film, you know, there are certain you know, layers. I mean, we're all familiar with the WRA photographs, you know, Toyomi Atake, mm -hmm. but you know, you just keep digging and digging and there's just more more out there. And so I, I think that's very helpful. And of course I've, I've worked with this archive before. So I was really um, trying to, to use images that hadn't been used, you know, before as much. Um, and also to to kind of shed light on different aspects of that archive, right? Um, so there's that. And of course, since the film is covering so many different histories, there's other archives that, you know, will speak to those different stories. I feel like that because the film also was was made over such a long period of time, it allowed me to, you know, take the very best images of this place because every time I went up there, I would shoot. And so it, it, it's just, and it's always stunning. The, the valley is always stunning. And so there's always, you know, another, another face that could be captured and another detail that could be, you know, a little gem that you could find. So I think it's all of those aspects that, you know, came together. And, and I really want to acknowledge the, the aerial photographers, um, both of them, Jesse and Mariah, Jesse, Jesse, Archer and, and Mariah David are from Big Pine and they are, you know, they know that place very intimately. And so I feel like they also, you know, their vision and their perspective is also in the film. They're part of the Big Pine tribe. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask Jen a quick question before I um, turn to Warren and Karen or Kathy. Um, so how did you get involved in this project? And as producer, can you tell us, I mean, obviously this took a long time, but because there were so many different, I feel like strands, you know, that you were trying to weave together in the different communities and finding their intersections. Tell me a little bit about your, um, I guess how you came onto the project and what your experience was like in creating this film with Anne. So I, I've known Anne for a while now because Anne was my mentor in the Armed with a Camera Fellowship that's hosted by Visual Communications. It is also where I met my husband and <laughs> Anne was my mentor and we were all um, in this class She's a together matchmaker. for the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I remember Anne was very stern <laughs> and I was all over the place and, you know, I was young and just like, doing all sorts of things. And um, 10 years after, Anne called me and asked me to produce it. And at first I didn't um, really see a connection with me, you know? And I said, well, I'm Korean, I'm not Japanese American, and I'm not really an, an environmentalist. I don't really know why I should care about this. And then, um, but I read this treatment and I read the article that was written about it. And of course I cared about it. <laughs> like. There's so many common issues and of course, like, I think that uh, my identity as an Asian American is something that's always constantly evolving, but I felt like, you know, this shared history and just feeling like how I am in America, like, I just felt like that there was that connection of the Asian American identity and also being um, someone from Los Angeles and not knowing any of this stuff. Like I only knew really about the Japanese American incarceration, but only from, you know, several documentaries I've seen. It's not that we are ever taught this in school. And if you go to college and you have the privilege of having an Asian American studies department, maybe you will learn about it, right, in college. So, um, I didn't know that the same land where we get our water from is all, was also the same land that incarcerated Japanese Americans and that forced removed Native Americans. And it, I suddenly felt this like huge responsibility as someone who lived in Los Angeles to really know where my water came from. And I think just that part of me switching on my brain and, and caring about it, I really felt like the impact of the film would actually carry a lot of meaning for many people who live in Los Angeles. And um, that was like really the the reason. Plus like Anne is amazing. She's not really that stern anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, our working relationship was amazing. You know, she really brought me on to be her partner like from the get go. And I just feel like, you know, since we've been working on this since together since 2017, Anne has been doing it, you know, earlier than that. But when I joined in 2017 until now, I just really feel like our working relationship is so great. Like I just want to keep working with Anne. Like I really feel like her creative partner. Um, and I hope I brought a lot of like what I've learned in those 10 years before this film to the project. Um, and I'm really excited about the impact campaign of this project because if it could move me, you know, to be better about just knowing where my water comes from, appreciating it, and doing my best in educating others with this film, I know that other people watching this film will feel exactly the same way. And then they will want to spread um, the message of this film and the importance of really knowing our shared histories to build solidarity, not just you know knowing this part, that part, that part, but like, where's the connection, right? And I think that intersectional layer was something that I haven't seen before in other documentaries and it's really powerful when you see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Kathy, I wanted to turn to you. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but um, how did you, I guess, how did you first meet Anne, since it's been so long? Um, and what did you think about, you know, her idea of doing this film and exploring perhaps some of the um, shared histories, you know, between the Japanese American internees as well as the native communities who live there, um, and not to mention the other uh, 
ranchers and communities as well. I mean, what did you think when Anne approached you and have you been approached previously uh, to be a protagonist in a film like this? Um, I, I remember it well when Anne called me and she just called and said, I'm, I'm doing a film and I wonder if I could interview you. She didn't have any idea what I knew it was about Manzanar and I happened to be going to Bishop that day. So I just stopped by and sat and talked to her and everything. And she wasn't that, like she said, she wasn't really sure exactly what the movie was going to be about. So I thought, okay, but she just wanted to know, you know, from a basic perspective, you know, what it was like there and, and how the indigenous people lived on that land. And so that was easy. And we just had a really good conversation and, I really liked your questions because they weren't like leading or anything, but really made you think and want to describe. So I was I was kind of impressed with her interview style. So I remembered that and I said, okay, I got that done and went on. And then she kept calling back. And then the next thing I, she says, okay, I got another grant. Now I've got to do some character development. And I was like, oh, I thought I was done. <laughs> No, you don't want my character. <laughs> but she kept coming back, and we did, and and it was fun. And but the main thing when when she started getting all of this footage after all these years was how do you put that together in one story? So when they came up with pretty close to the final project, I was totally amazed. And uh, you know, because I'm willing to talk to anybody, and I have done a couple other. Uh, little films and documentaries, interviews and stuff. And because I'm willing to talk to anybody who is interested in where their water comes from and just the extractive uh, resources uh, that we have in this valley that are being taken all the time. So that's kind of what I do is advocate for our poor little valley here. And so I'm willing to talk to it, but I was really glad when I got involved with this project because I feel they did an amazing job of a really interesting, uh, thorough telling story. Thank Pretty you. Proud of Thank you, Kathy. And I wanted to ask Warren the same question. I mean, did you know Anne before or did she approach you um, for the film? And what did you think going into the film? We uh, had not met Anne before, uh, but actually I wasn't that surprised relative to a film project on Manzanar. Uh, it was already mentioned about visual communications. The founder of, uh, one of the founders, Bob Nakamura, I think one of the first films of visual communications was about Manzanar because Bob himself was in Manzanar. And although Manzanar is an issue in the Japanese American community, the concentration camp issue was sort of like hiding in plain sight what I mean by that is it was always a reference point, but always sort of quietly in hushed tones. It was a touchstone that people would mention uh, at family gatherings in the community, but usually sort of obliquely, not directly. Just uh, were you in camp or were you born after camp? If you knew someone in camp. So it was always there, but not really discussed. And for someone like myself, that was born after camp, post-war, it just became sort of an open question. And then as a political activist, when we were looking around at different issues related to Asian Pacific Islander community, related to issues like racism, learning from the civil rights movement, the farm workers movement, we knew that we had issues historically, but connecting to them was something that we needed to find where that nexus was. And for me, that nexus, that issue of interconnecting, as someone had already mentioned, has always sort of been a, a part of the Manzanar pilgrimage. I mean, initially it started out as a history lesson. It was very provocative because no one would really talk about it openly, specifically in the Japanese American community very seldom would the uh, Issei or Nisei, first and second generation, talk about it. And when we as Japanese American third generation, fourth generation, sort of stumbled onto the issue, 
we sort of started digging around and uh, for myself as an organizer, it started by trying to figure out well, the farmers had just marched to Sacramento to talk about the plight of the agricultural workers in the Central Valley. Dr. King had connected the Poor People's March with the Civil Rights Movement. And so there was a march in Washington. Uh, as activists, we were very involved in many marches and demonstrations against the Vietnam War. So it was Japanese, American, and Asian Pacific Islander activists. A friend of mine and I, Victor Shibata, we knew we had to march somewhere. We just didn't know where. And we had all heard about this camps in our own family stories, but really didn't know what it was. So we started investigating about camp. And as someone had already said, there wasn't in school. He didn't read about it. The only book at that time was a book by a guy named Tom Boswell called America's Concentration Camps. But as I said, nobody talked about it. It wasn't taught in school. Asian American studies had not started yet on our campuses. So we started digging around to sort of the first person sources, in other words, people that were actually in camp and started to piece together what this was and realized that Manzanar was the first camp uh, that we heard about and the closest in Los Angeles. So we thought, well, maybe we'll march to Manzanar. Then we realized how far Manzanar was. So we decided we better go there. So Victor and I went there for the first time before there was any pilgrimages and discovered the camp just by accident because we were on the east side of 395 and thought we were at Manzanar. We ran into these cowboys in a pickup truck and they asked us boys when we were doing that, we told them that uh, we were boys, we were men, and we were looking for races like you that put us in camp. We were sort of filled with piss and vinegar back in those days. And they just laughed at us, and which really got us upset. And then they said, if you guys are looking for the camps the Japanese were put in during World War II, it's on the, it's on the west side of 395. So without their directions, we never would have found it. So that's when we discovered the camp and we discovered the guard houses and the auditorium. But we heard about the cemetery in the back. So we found the road and drove back there and that's when we discovered the obelisk that just sort of interesting in that it's very geometric, all straight lines, this, uh, this beacon, with a backdrop of the Sierra Nevada mountains and an upper desert with tumbleweeds and all kinds of different things on the terrain. So it stuck out and then of course it had the black Japanese writing, although very weathered. It really stuck out in the landscape and was very dramatic. Uh, Mount Whitney in the background. Mm -hmm. So that has become the center, the iconic center of all the pilgrimages since then. But after the initial discovery around the history and the many, many chapters and unfolding, it's like peeling an onion with this issue. The issue yeah, has was always the interconnection of the camp and other political issues. So when I yeah, wanted to talk about water in relationship to Manstar, that rang a bell because when we first looked at the issue of of securing the camp site. We wanted to find out who owned the land and then we found out it was the Department of Water and Power for the city of Los Angeles, which made no sense to us at all, at all until you started learning the history of water. And then when yeah. we started looking into the history of water, we had already made the connection with our sisters and brothers of the Native American community because the first agency in the government that was given the charge of handling the camps the Japanese were put in was the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they had done dealt with reservations. So the interconnection of the first removal of people, people of color, because we were inconveniently in the way of whether it was the expansion of the destiny of, of the full expansion of the United States or the fulfillment of agribusiness in the Central Valley 
to get the small Japanese farmers out of the way after the depression, it all was interconnected. So when Ann yeah. said we wanted to, she wanted to talk about water, it wasn't that big of a leap relative to politically understanding how it all interconnect. Thank you, Thank you Warren. Um, actually, we actually, have a few questions question from our audience, audience and, and you know, similar, similar to, to what you've what already you've brought, brought up. up. Um, um, it's resonating with a lot of people. We're getting a lot of people saying it's a beautiful, very touching film and thanking you you all for making this film. Uh, but one question, one um, viewer, Linda, I believe, asks about, you know, how, you know, making intersectional films like this one that touch on various communities and issues. And her question is, you do it so well, and what advice can you give about, you know, <laughs> how to do this right because uh, you know it deals with not just different issues of land ownership and land rights and water rights um indigenous rights but also the indigenous community the japanese american communities um do you have any advice <laughs> will, <laughs> how I do will, you do this i will say it's a long process and it isn't easy um i think this film you know uh, it's been more than five years in the making, um, and it's been a lot of research and many trips there and many, many cuts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll just say it's a long process. And um, I think I think for me personally, what's important is always trying to convey the complexities of, of different stories. Um, and so I think that's kind of if you if you sort of look at all of my films that that's what I think do think that they share. But you know, I, I just say it's 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 a long process. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to do a quick if you guys could give a brief answer what you would like people to take away from watching this film. We could have a quick go around. Maybe we could start with uh, you, Kathy, and then Warren. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, I I think one quick uh, takeaway would be just the um, learning about where you live and and what you're doing to places where you don't live. That knowledge of where your water comes from, and that if we all work together, which shows in this film that we can come up with solutions and make this place a better so that there is a future for all of us to survive, not destroy one for another. That's great advice. Thank you, Kathy. And Warren, just quickly, what would you like people to take away from the film? You know, particularly during this time when people look at things sort of disconnected, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's anti-Asian hate, whether it's the issues we're dealing with at the border with undocumented immigrants coming into the country. Uh, it's all connected. It's all a part of, and that's why the word systemic has been used more and more. And I think the foundation on which it all sits is the issue of how we treat the land and the environment. So whether we're talking about Manzanar or we're talking about water or whatever the issue might be, it's all interconnected. And so is the solution. So the solution is interconnected with all of us. Thank you. That's great. It's lovely. And Jen, and then right. Anne will have the last word. Um, I'm just echoing everyone who just said stuff. But yeah, I think one takeaway is just that there are these infrastructures and systems in place that will remove different communities if they stand in the way. And as, as much as, um, you know, like I think it's just, very important for all of us to understand what these systems look like and see who are connected, who who are the communities that are being affected by it. Because if it's not our community, it's someone else. You know, it's not just going to go away without people doing something about it. Thank you. And, and also, if you could tell people where to find the film next after you're done. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll do that before I forget. Um, so we are actually also screening right now at the Milwaukee Film Festival, if people want to try to tell their friends and catch it there. Um, if you're in Canada, I think today's the last day at DOXA, which is in Vancouver. Um, and then next month in June, 
will be at the um, DC International Film Festival. Um, but you know, al always you can look at our website for more information and um, we'll be continuing to have other um, screenings all over. Um, but in terms of, of, of what we would like people to take away, I think it's really just an appreciation for their land and for their water. And, you know, um, also trying to create a paradigm shift about how we do perceive our land and water. And maybe we need to rethink the way we go about things, you know, I don't, as radical as that seems, I feel like it's, it's really important because we can't continue to just take and take and take. Thank you. Those are great last words. Thank you so much. I know we are out of time, but thank you so much, Anne, Jen, Kathy, and Warren for being here with us this evening. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Please catch, oh, Anne, did oh, you have I one just wanted to say if, if I have friends out there um, and if you want to come, we're having a quick after party. If you want to come, you know, email or text me and I'll send you the information. <laughs> yes, um, but, don't forget to catch the rest of CamFest this week online at camfest.com. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Warren. Sure. Thank you, Warren and Kathy. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. We'll send, oh, my daughter is photobombing. <laughs> <laughs>